you know, there's, there's some things that I think the church gets really right, you know. Um, I, I could list them, but um, well, just use your, use your own imagination and experience. But I think there's some things that we really, really mess up bad. We really blow. Um, and, and, and I think when, when you analyze the church, its structures, the way we do things, how we do things, it becomes uh, Im immediately apparent. Like, for example, you ask people, uh, and it's not necessarily uh, unchurch people or non-church people, um, even people within the church, when you say God the Father, what's the first image that comes to mind? Old white guy. Old white guy. Right? The beard. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the Michelangelo thing, you know? Um, old white guy. And we just sang that song, uh, sorry to spring it on you, uh, but we just sang that song by Bob Dylan. And I think Bob Dylan in that song demonstrates, I don't know like whether he has any sort of faith or not or what he believes or doesn't believe, but that song is about God, you know? Uh, just, just like a lot of Simon Garfunkel stuff, you know, I refer to them a lot. Their, their, their stuff is about God. Like if God is, however we want to jazz it up or and culturize it or Judeo-Christianize it, if God is the force that causes all things to come into being, uh, the anti-entropy force, if that's what God is, then Bob Dylan's song is about God. You know? But we're human beings and we like to put things in nice, neat little compartments uh, that helps us, at least in the short term, to understand. And so over the course of our history, over the course of developing our theologies, we have come up with images that describe God in a way that may or may not be or may or may not have been culturally rele relevant. But I really want to ask the question this morning, especially as it relates to the epistle reading. So that, that's what I'm hoping to tie all in together in 15 minutes. Uh, ask whether that's relevant anymore. You know, think of some of the stained glass windows you've seen in your life. Stained glass windows were originally brought in to tell the stories of Jesus. You know, people would look at the stained glass windows and they would see the story. P particularly good for a, an illiterate time, a non-literate time. Uh, St. Mary's doesn't have stained glass windows, but at one point in its history, very early on, uh, some people decided that it was important that at St. Mary's we tell the stories. And so we tell the stories here in banners, you know. Um, and, and, and sometimes the, the, the picture leads to a question, like the one about confirmation that I love so much. Um, why is a duck diving into a barbecue? No, that's not, that's Pentecost, the, the, the duck diving into a barbecue. Um, uh, and then what's, why, why is there a pigeon uh, in the one with the bishop? Uh, you know, there's things like that. People just, just don't know until you tell them the story. Um, but very often the stories were told in a cultural way which means most of us, the stained glass windows that we are brought up in, are white western old God, you know? Um, and, 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 and I think one of the things that we're observing today is our society has rejected that image as frankly I think it should be rejected in many ways, not only, but in many ways. Actually, it should be accepted, but in its proper place and many more images added to it to hopefully complete the image of God, or at least come closer to completing the image of God, because our image is not, is not nearly full enough. I'll give you just, just one story from my own life. I was gonna have three, but uh, I'm, I'm only gonna give you one. Uh, a lot of years ago, some of you know this, a lot of years ago, uh, I went on a trip to Haiti as, as a theological student. And in Haiti, it's a, it's a different culture, it's a different church culture, frankly, much more traditional than we are in, in, in Canada, very traditional. And uh, seminarians and ministers go around in their soutane, which is like cassock, you know, the long black robe? Uh, but in the tropics, it's white, not black. So here was I, I was 20-ish, uh, um, and in those days, I had hair and a lot of it. Uh, it was down to here, and I had a big, bushy black beard. And so here I was, long hair, big bushy, bushy black beard, wearing a white robe. And one time I went on a trip to one of the missions, and uh, the missions in the mountains, you know. Uh, just, just imagine a National Geographic special and, and you're in the right ballpark. Well, there was a little kid who asked the priest that was my, my host and, you know, supervisor, uh, he, he looked at me and said, Liezoe? Which in Creole means, is that Jesus? 
Because you see, what had happened was the Americans, God bless them, you know, had been providing Sunday school curriculums to Haiti for, for years, generations. And they're used, David C. Cook, Sunday school curriculums. Jesus was always white. He was always Western. He always had shoulder length hair and a beard. He was, I will grant you, far better groomed than I was. But at the same time, Jesus was white and Western. And it's almost ridiculous to say it, but I'm going to throw it in as well. Male. Jesus was male. Um, and so to identify with Jesus, you had to be able to identify with that picture. And so the kid wanted to know, here is this white guy in a white robe with long hair and a beard. Is that Jesus? It's kind of flattering. And uh, no, not the same kid, but I think it was a member of his family kept coming up to me and moving, moving the, the arm of my robe because uh, he, he, he wanted to know whether I was white all the way up or whether it was just the parts he could see. Isn't that cute? Our, our culture so dictates our understanding, okay? Our culture so dictates our understanding. And our culture of church dictates our understanding of church. And one of the ways in which we have missed it so entirely, it's, well, it's, it's, it's really sad and it's tragic, not only for us but for the world, is in our understanding of the priesthood. You know, I started off with this thing about our understanding of God because I thought everybody would go, yeah, okay, yeah, we, we, we get that. We know that God isn't an old white guy. You know, that God is much more uh, than that. And that God might even have a feminine side. That God might be not non-sexual but transsexual. You know, I didn't say transgender because that has a cultural image but transsexual beyond our human understanding of sexuality. Um, so any of our understandings of God are going to be filtered by our limits as human beings. Okay, so God is trans. You can get that. Um, but how about when, when, when we're talking about priests and the priesthood? Um, if I was asked to ask you all to write a one-paragraph essay, I would never do that. And the only reason I'm using this as an example is because Marie's become a teacher. And so I think essays and I think teaching and I think classes and more than I used to. A one page, a one chapter, one paragraph uh, essay on what's a priest. You know, I don't think too many people in this congregation would have male as a determinant. Uh, I think most are beyond that. No, maybe not all. Um, and you might think, funny shirt, you might think that. Uh, you might think robes. You, some of you would probably put in sacraments, like the communion. You might put in ordination. And, and, and you'd be right. But you wouldn't be completely biblical. Because our understanding of priest has become churchified rather than based on the biblical root from which the word comes. Now the reason why I'm doing this sermon today is because last week we had a sermon about Melchizedek the priest. You know, and this week we're talking about the priesthood again. And I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the priesthood and, and, and get you on board with this because it, it, I think it's crucial for understanding of our own who we are as individuals and as who we are as a community. Um, Long, long time ago, we're talking like 4,500 years ago or so, maybe even more, um, God had an encounter with an individual whose name was Abram. And this is before Abraham, I didn't pronounce it wrong, it was Abram. And God, because he's God, and uh, I'm not going to do a whole lot of explanation of God, I did a little bit how I understand God before, just to set the context. God spoke to Abram. Now, whether he spoke in an audible voice or Abram got a sense or a dawning awareness or I don't know, um, spoke is good shorthand. Okay, so God spoke to Abram and asked something of him. And we basically asked him to leave where he was and to go to a land that he was going to show him. Um, and that was not a metaphor in that particular case. These days, I think sometimes God asks us to leave where we are and to go to a place that he's going to show us and can be more of a metaphor. Maybe not, um, but, but, but it can be more of a metaphor. Um, on the way, they were, they were to interact and build a relationship. And as most of us learn over time in this human life of ours, 
the best relationships tend to be those forged through difficult circumstances. You know, it's 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 our superficial friendships uh, that are only like party oriented. You know, all of us probably have a certain number of people that we see at parties or barbecues or you know stuff like that. Those tend not to be our our, our, our really good buddies. Uh, our really good buddies tend to be the ones that are with us in, in times of struggle or difficulty or, or, or whatever. So God and Abraham are, 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 are interacting, Abram's on a journey, etc., etc., etc. And there comes a point where God says to Abram, and note that it's God taking the initiative here, I'm going to make an agreement with you, a covenant it's called in the Bible, and covenant is, is basically a religious word for contract. Uh, I'm going to make a contract with you. And here's what's going to happen. Uh, I, for, 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 for my part, I'm going to do three things for you. Um, and for your part, if you obey my voice and do the things that I'm telling you today, uh, here's the three things that are going to happen. You're going to be a people for my own possession. You're going to be a holy nation. And you're going to be a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests, get it? Because in the time of Abraham, he came out of Ur in the Chaldees. Uh, it was not, there, it's not that there was no religion until Judaism came along. People have always been religious, as well as spiritual. Uh, they've always been religious. So they would have known religion, they would have known worship, they would have known all that sort of stuff. And there was this special class of people that would be the priests, the ones that do the stuff, you know, that have the magic or the mojo or whatever you want to call it. And God is saying, that's not going to be the way it is with you. You know, you're going to be a holy nation. You're going to be my own possession. That's the relational aspect there. And you're going to be a kingdom of priests. It's not going to be an exclusive cl class. There's going to be a kingdom of priests. Well, what do priests do? Priests, amongst other things, offer sacrifice. And that's what they do. And so God is basically saying, I'm going to create a, peop a nation of people whose role it is to offer sacrifice. Now, when you say offer sacrifice, immediately there's a whole lot of images that can come to mind. You know, killing a lamb on an altar, you know, or, or giving money or, or, or whatever. Um, that, 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 is, that is partially biblical, but not completely biblical. Um, the biblical sacrifice begins with offering of oneself, you know. And again, I could back this up in all sorts of ways, but this is a sermon, not a lecture. Uh, and, 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 and so I don't have time to do it. But just think of what happened in Egypt uh, around the time of the Passover and the plagues and the death of the firstborn and all the symbolism there and the lamb that was sacrificed and the blood on the doorposts and the lintels. You get all these images of, of, of sacrifice, okay? So a priest was one who would make sacrifice on behalf of the nation for his own sins and for, for the sins of the nation. And just an image to give you, you've all heard the term scapegoat. Where that comes from is a biblical thing, where once a year, the high priest would confess all the sins of the people with his hand on the scapegoat. It wasn't called a scapegoat in those days, on the goat. And then send it out to the desert to die and announce to the people that as far as that, that's how far God will separate us from our sins. So that's, that's where the term scapegoat came from. But what God is saying is no longer is there going to be this class of priests doing all of that. You're all priests. You're all priests. You're all going to be making sacrifice for the sins of the nation and for your own sins. There's not going to be a special class. A holy nation, a people for my own possession, and a kingdom of priests. Now the interesting thing about the Old Testament part is it's in the future. You shall be to me. Remember that Abram is on a journey here. It hasn't all taken place yet. He's going from Ur to a land that God is going to show him when this event takes place. We're talking future tense here. Well, then the question can be, how far in the future are we talking? Like, when in the future is this all going to take place? Is it going to be taking place soon? Like when Jesus was resurrected and he said, I'll come back. And they thought it was going to be like in a matter of weeks you know, until time went on. Are we talking soon? Are we talking future? Are we talking way in the future? You know, um, in, in Judaism today, it's still praying next year in Jerusalem, you know, when everything is made the way it's, 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 it's supposed to be. Well, it's not defined there, but what we do know is when we flip to the New Testament 
and we've seen the death of Jesus, the resurrection and Pentecost, and my sermon last week was talking about the significance of that and how we relate to that. So this is really part B of last week's part A. Um, what, 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 what then goes on is, well, how do we interpret this now? Um, please tell me, it's not, it's not 10 to yet. It's close to, it is. You know what, I was looking at the clock up there and the clock is 10 minutes slow. Guys? Oh, it's stopped. My sermons stop clocks. <laughs> I'm not ready to stop yet. Sorry, guys. I thought I had another 10 minutes. Oh, anyway. Uh, so we're, we're in the New Testament. And so what basically happens is the New Testament community is trying to understand its identity. They know all this stuff about covenant with Abraham, make you a holy nation, people for my own possession, a nation of priests. There was the captivity in Egypt, the deliverance from slavery, the journey towards the promised land, but that got messed up too. Now Jesus has come as the new Passover. Remember that from you? And okay, Jesus is the new Passover. And unlike those sacrificial lambs, he didn't have the grace to lie down and stay dead. Uh, he rose, so he said, that's my kingdom. And so there's something about the kingdom there, but he's not talking about sand and stones. He's talking about a different sort of kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world, but he talks of his kingdom. Then there's Pentecost, and something happens where everybody receives the Holy Spirit. That doesn't sound very Jewish, because it used to be Holy Spirit anointing for a specific purpose, like kingship or prophecy. Ordinary people didn't get that, but everybody's getting that now. And there was this Tower of Babel thing where we can be like God, built this incredible tower, it comes crashing down, and there's this confusion of languages. That's the symbol. And now we have Pentecost, and what's Pentecost? Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, and one of the things is everybody's out in the street, and the people who are there from all the nations because it's Passover, we're hearing them speak in our own language. So it's sort of a reverse Tower of Babel. What's all go And the kingdom is, what, what is this? And so Peter, on reflection, Second Peter, if you want to look it up, he says to the, to, to, to the people, to the followers, he says, because you are God's own possession. Not you're going to be someday. You are God's possession. You are a holy nation. And you know what else he says? You are a kingdom of priests. You are a kingdom of priests. So, through the death, resurrection, and resurrection of Jesus and, and the Pentecost, what God promised Abraham all those years ago has come to fulfillment by God's action because of our disobedience. We had a chance of stepping into it, or people had a chance of stepping into it for millennia. It didn't happen. My way rather than your way, God. But then through God's action. And so that also gives some understanding to why Jesus became human as well. Had to become human. It's representative of the human race. It just sort of, it, all these things connect and they lock in. So that means like you and me sitting here today, we are priests. Um, now I'm a particular type of priest. Uh, because of church structures, ecclesiology, because of money, because of structure and order, uh, because we have a British heritage, that's part of it too. Um, I wear this shirt and I'm appointed the rector of the parish of Beaconsfield Kirkland St. Mary's Church and I have a particularly sacramental function. That defines my priesthood category, or in, in, in some categories, um, but that comes from something else. That external, the sacramental stuff, the collar and the church and all the rest, that external comes from something internal. And the internal thing is that Christ has made me a priest, just like he's made every single one of you a priest. And what does a priest do? A priest offers sacrifice for himself, for herself, for their family, their children, for their neighbors, and for the world. And sometimes that sacrifice is as simple as a helping hand. Uh, sometimes the sacrifice is 
feeding the poor, visiting the sick, hanging with the marginalized, with the prisoners, wherever you find yourself in your daily life, that is where God is calling you to exercise your vocation as a priest. I absolutely guarantee you 100% God does not want everybody to go home this afternoon, call Montreal Diocesan Theological College and say, Lauren says I need to get ordained. That is not God. If you hear that voice, that is not God. But what God does say is, wherever you are, that is where you to, are to offer sacrifice. And in so doing, you become, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, a co-creator of the new kingdom. If any of you have ever seen the Narnia Chronicles, you know, you know exactly what that's like. The new reality is percolating. The new reality is it's percolating under the surface. Every now and then we get little flashes of the kingdom. New things happening. Yeah, there's a lot of death and destruction. I talk about that more than I should, perhaps. But just below the surface, there's all sorts of good things happening. The penny is dropping on people, realizing that we're not islands, we're not all alone. It's not just about me. But I'm called to sacrifice myself. And I'm called to sacrifice my life for the sake of those whom I love and those who I don't even know, and to offer who I am and what I am uh, for the sake of a, of a lost and hurting world. That's Christ's example. That's what we're called to. Peter understood that. And that's why he could say, and that's why the author of the, letters, uh, the letter to the Hebrews, in talking about the priesthood, Melchizedek and all the rest of it, why, they, why, why that person could say too. You know, in the olden days, when God made the deal, the covenant, the contract with Abraham, it was a promise for the future. But now that Christ has come, now that he's died, now that he rose, now that he sent his spirit, and you've received that, and in brackets, we in the established church remember that in baptism and confirmation, first communion, all those things. Now that that's happened, it's no longer in the future. You are a holy nation right here. This is as holy as the nation gets. Right here, you are a holy nation. You are God's own possession, and there is nothing you can do about it because you are His possession, whether you like it or not. You are His possession, and you're all priests. That's good news. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your call to service, and whatever language we use, whatever jargon we use, we do tend to make it stained glass language a lot of the time. Uh, maybe we should learn to speak more plainly and, and be more understood. Um, we offer you that calling to be servants. Uh, just as Jesus gave the example of how we are supposed to serve one another. And God, we pray for your world, for the lost, the lonely, the marginalized, those who are in need. We pray for our calling as a parish to be your light in the communities that we're called to serve. Lord, where we're off the path, bring us back, and where we're right, confirm and strengthen it. We offer you these prayers and all our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, as we do every Sunday, we stand and share in exchanging the peace, an outward visible sign of an inward.